Welcome again to our third annual symposium on plant phenotyping uh, mobilizing PERC. It's my pleasure today to introduce our third speaker, Dr. Tala Awada from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. You may know Tala from last year. She was also a speaker in this conference or as a PhD student in plant science at the University of Saskatchewan or because she's my sister. <laughs> So Tala is uh, Associate Dean at the uh, Agricultural Research Division and Professor in the School of Natural Resources in Nebraska. She co-leads the Nebraska Long-Term Ecosystem Research Network and the establishment of plant phenotyping facility in Lincoln. Her work is in the, in the areas of plant physiology, crop abiotic, uh, forest and grassland ecology, and the related issues of climate change. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Tala Awada. Thank you, Lana, and thank you for the organizers for having me again this year. Um, it's always a pleasure to come back to Saskatoon. It's a great place. I have fantastic experiences, had fantastic experiences over here. Um, so today I'm just going to give you an update of my presentation of last year and tell you where we're at this year in our efforts to move forward the, the topic or the science of plant phenomics. Um, here at the bottom of the page, I'm not going to talk about it, but it's our new toy, the solar-induced fluorescence investment on an aircraft, which we think it has fantastic capabilities into starting getting more and more into the mechanistic and biophysical traits that govern some of these phenomic uh, traits that we see. So maybe next year, if we're still here. Um, let me see, next. So we've all seen these images before about the global increase in population, and we've seen the 250, 2050 predictions. But let's look beyond that. It's going to continue to increase, and we're going to be even more challenged by the increase or change in dietary habits of people. We're going to see a more increase in cereal uptake, meat and dairy, and so on. So how do we effectively address these insecurities and food and make enough food available for everyone. And of course, the middle line here, the blue one, is the median number. This is assuming that families are not going to have a half child on average more or one child less on average. So we are all familiar with those. And we have been doing a great job at increasing our um, food production, but it's still going to fall short. We have not been able to, to meet our two and a half increase in yield annually to meet the future demand for food. As, uh, this is as long as we don't increase the acreages that will uh, be transformed into ag land. So we have lots of work ahead of us to make sure that we improve the, the productivity on existing land. And we've done a great job at reducing hunger in the world, but we, the trend is, is, uh, is going in the other direction since 2017. We've seen a steady increase in hunger uh, in the last three years. And this has been attributed to climate change and, of course, conflict. Today, if you've read the news coming from BBC uh, in Yemen, they're going to have the worst um, 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 food insecurity or starvation in the last 100 years, 13 million people are going to be suffering from, uh, from this. And so at UNL, we are trying to take an integrated system approach to address this. And we're getting everybody together. We know that we can't do it without the breeders, without the molecular biologists, and we have at our hands fantastic tools these days in terms of modern breeding, CRISPR technology, and so on. Um, and, and how can we use these technologies to develop new and develop diverse genetic makeup to, to, to address the global climate change? And how can we effectively test these uh, genotypes using technologies like phenomic technologies and integrated within the digital agricultural platforms that many of us are using in developed world, but make it available in a simplistic way to be used by uh, farmers who still, who still uh, constitute 70% of the, of the farms in, 
in, in developing countries with land less than two acres. So how can we transform such technologies to help them with their decision-making process using perhaps their cellular phones and so on? and increase the, the flow of information uh, between farmers. I think the Bill Gates and, and other uh, uh, philanthropists have developed this network between farmers in two countries. I think it's called We Plan, and it has been proven very successful where farmers are communicating across the countries and, across, and with other countries, not only on giving advices to each other, but also on exchanging seeds and so on. So something like this we need to continue developing. And of course, with all this, we need to actually meet the immediate needs that are now, whether it's using, uh, promoting more the GMO crops in some of these countries that have shown to be very effective at tackling some of these issues, but for some political reasons, they have not been um, used at their full potential. There was this article that came out uh, just recently in September, I think, 2018, whereby um, these scientists, by using models and, and understanding the behavior of farmers and, uh, and changing the decision-making process of farmers, they have been able to, to conclude that in the last 50 years, had there been different ways of using the land and different selection process, in fact, we would have increased the production by 1% in many areas. So this again goes into the role of management system in improving uh, the crop production um, across. I want to go to what Dr. Noble said before me. It's in, if we go back to the phenomics, which is how do we test these genotypes? How do we get the maximum information to move the science forward? It is an interdisciplinary science, and it requires lots of input from various places. We've all, we all agree that it requires uh, lots of input from our hard plant life science people. Uh, we need the infrastructure. We can't do it without a significant infrastructure. And we need the data uh, management and analysis tool. And to me, this has been the biggest bottleneck for us. For us, and I hear others are still facing the same thing, um, it goes beyond the data management. It goes beyond the metadata. We develop our own metadata system. How elaborate this metadata system has to be, it's also a challenge. How do we communicate and share data across networks? And how can they effectively use our data? Even if we have an open source, it's very, the metadata uh, system behind it is not very well developed to make it usable. And to think 50 years from now, how can they tap on these images? Many of us don't even know how much information these images have. So that, to me, is a big bottleneck that it's a priority for us. And, and I think it's a priority for many other institutions. And of course, we need those great statisticians who are able to give us the, the information and feedback into new hypotheses across the, the spectrum. So if we look at the number of publications in the area of plant phenomics, I went back to the, to the 1990, and I on purposely went there, because in, two, in 1991, there was one paper on plant phenomics from Bonn in, in Germany, but then we didn't have many, then some uh, showed up. But nevertheless, articles that have used the word plant phenomics in their publications is steadily increasing since the beginning, since the beginning of 2010. So you see there's a big move towards this area at, uh, hopefully, and will continue to move. I don't think we have reached our capacity yet. We're still in the early phases of it. But it's good that we have around over 300 publications in uh, 2017 that have used that word in their, in their publication record. It's 2018. We still have three months. Hopefully, that number will, will go up. So here, uh, about our investments, we have, um, we have uh, made three new investments to complement the existing facilities at UNL. And two of them are readily available from the Lenatech, uh, which I'm going to focus on the second one over here, which is the greenhouse facility today and how, how we have, uh, where we're at. And the third one, which is the field phenomic facility, I know that my colleague, Dr. Guy, is going to be presenting on it. 
But for the third facility, we went in a very unconventional way. We talked to Spidercam, which is a broadcasting company. And if you've seen their cameras floating around in, in stadiums and in concerts, they basically, it's a carrier platform that follows players around or, or, or artists. And we, we selected it to cover a one acre land. Um, the advantage of this is that it has a 30 kilogram of payload and you can exchange cameras which way you want. And most importantly, it really deals with the impact of shading and allows us to do diurnal curves because when we're now more interested in the mechanistic and the biophysical traits that govern these morphological traits uh, afterward, so this allows you to go to the same plot over and over again, um, automated, fully automated, and get these signatures using the various cameras. So my emphasis now is gonna be on the, on the greenhouse facility, but this new investment really complements the existing facilities that we have, and the idea is how can we extrapolate traits across scales, and what are these traits that best describe the function of these plants and thus the morphology? So um, several of you may, may be familiar with this. We have the Center of Advanced Land Management System in operation for many years, and they have been using these phenomic uh, techniques and tools uh, for several years. We just revamped our, our aircraft with the new hyperspectral and solar-induced fluorescence to be able, again, to extrapolate these variables across scales. So this is our, our uh, greenhouse facility. It's a Lemnatec. It's a 672 pots. Each pot can, uh, can take up to 10 liters of, of soil. And uh, the plants, the system is equipped uh, with four cameras or four chambers, um, the, the RGB, the uh, infrared, the fluorescence, and the hyperspectral. And plants, it has also its own uh, automated watering stations and weighing stations where the pot, uh, each, each pot is barcoded. So each pot gets the treatment that is uh, specified by the investigator and then it moves from one chamber to the other for imaging. And it does it in, in 3D way. So you can imagine the, the volume of data that's accumulated daily for each plant. And the 3D, you decide on the number of views that you would like to take for each pot that's entering these chambers. So the data become massive very quickly. And so data management and, and data analysis is our biggest bottleneck. And your best translators in the room between the breeders and the computer scientists, in my opinion, are the ecophysiologists, especially those who have worked with, uh, with optical traits of plants. Also the remote sensing, but the remote sensing tend to, to, to um, simplify the, the little differences and treat it as noise in the field, while the ecophysiologists and the breeders, they may be looking for these little noises and these little differences. So, but together, they, you can actually sit down and, and be the translator between the two entities. And so I am a very structural person, and we decided, I said, okay, guys, if we wanna look at the morphology, what are those traits that we want every breeder to have depending on their treatment and what they're looking at? Is it the architecture of the plant? Is it how the leaves are growing? Is it the angle of the leaves? What are the stresses that we think we're gonna superimpose? And how do we, how do we hypothesize the plant's gonna respond in response to this? So we took these into account, and then we looked, okay, what are the mechaniz mechanisms that govern these morphological traits afterward? And we wanna look more into the chlorophyll, the, the, the uh, carotenoids, the anthocyanins, and the photosynthetic efficiency, water use efficiency, nitrogen use efficiency. So this is, so our approach into data analysis was divided into these two uh, mechanisms, the morphological and the physiological. 
and we treated every, we're using deep learning, deep learning, yes, and uh, artificial intelligence, you can see I'm not a computer scientist, into, into, into dealing with this. So at each point in each um, image acquisition, this plan, this, this leaf or this image is in a axis of um, temporal axis and a spatial axis, and it's under certain environmental condition. So how can we develop these uh, training sets to be able to understand what's going on. And so for each of these plants that have been each images, we do viewing selection, we used plant architecture determination and, and things like leaf tracking, growth rate, and so on. This is, this is uh, and we divided them into what we call the holistic, how the architecture of the plant is developing and component, each component within the plant, how it is growing. I like this one with the automated leaf tracking because it really goes back to all the previous images and, and uh, identify each leaf, place a value on it. So if a leaf died, we, it's accounted for and you don't have to do this manually. So we have, we have been able to, to develop these, these algorithms for uh, corn, for soybean. We're working now on, sorry, for corn and sorghum and we're working now on soybean and cotton which have more complex um, structure. And with this, you can know each, plant, each leaf, when it emerges, how it grows, and when it passes. And I, and I forgot to say that the system handles plants up to two and a half meter tall, so you can really take them up to maturity as you are phenotyping them. The, the other components we looked at, again, is how the leaf is growing. The axis becomes very important if you're breeding for, let's say, uh, biofuel sorghum, where you have trade-offs between, between lignin and cellulose, and the structure of the stem becomes a problem. So that becomes very important for the breeders. So how, what is the angle of those in terms of wilting? How is the leaf wilting? How, what's the curling? So all those have to be automated and have to be captured by the system and, and deliver it to the user. And we have done, uh, we're also now working with, with wheat, and uh, we have been successful in relating. There's lots, there's lots of validation going on for every image and every plan that's taking. You have destructive measurements going on to make sure that what we're doing is sound and actually um, accurate. So we have been also working with the wheat. These are two wheat genotypes with, uh, with various grown on different soils um, under different phosphorus treatments, and we still see a very good relationship, over 90% correspondence between the image and the, and the um, destructive measures. But what this program that we created does not take into account is the overlapping of the leaves. So if you have a sorghum or you have a corn, that's not a big major issue. But now let's talk about soybean or cotton that have a much more complex structure. This system becomes really very difficult to, to, to implement. So the next step would be for us then is to develop the 3D metrics. And these have to be species specific because you can go, you have 360 views and you can go one degree. You have to decide on what is the optimum views to, to, to construct a 3D image with the highest accuracy. So to do this, we have put a checkboard just for validation purposes. We took 10 views of it, but we also tried to validate it with the corn and, 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 and sorghum for up to 62 views and, and uh, circulating around. I think uh, Sruti and the, our colleague is gonna be expanding more on this this afternoon. And so, um, this is the results. So we can now effectively create 3D image and predict its growth. And that is very important if you are gonna 
later on relate the genotype to the phenotype, associate the functional traits of certain genes, and can you subtract genes? Can you add genes? How can you predict the new phenotype using this 3D technology? And I think that's very important in this, in, in this work and removes a lot of the error associated with the 2D images. Again, we are in the greenhouse, it's a controlled environment, but the system has been very useful for the forward and the backward selection in, in breeding. Our next emphasis, so we have done lots of work on, on, on characterizing the morphological traits of certain crops that are important for us, but really we need to go into the mechanistic and biophysical traits. So we haven't put lots of effort initially on the hyperspectral images, and now we are focusing more and more on the hyperspectral aspect and what kind of traits we can extract from these images, and how can we superimpose them with the RGB cameras to, ma to get the maximum output. The simplest form, if you are remote sensing over here, the simplest form of this is the NDVI, which is the greenness, which is the health of the plants. How can we extract this in an efficient way? And if you talk to remote sensing, there are many formulas and algorithms that does this. And what works in a greenhouse may work in a lab or may not work in the field, so there's lots of uh, trial and error happening until we figure out what are these algorithms that will work under controlled environment. But that is one of those very easily to, to, to extract, where you have a simple 800 and 680 nanometer bands extracted from this hyperspectral. With simple formula, you can do it. The challenge is how can we do it automatically without the user interference and using a training uh, selection or, or images. And he says, I don't, I don't want to go into details about this, but, but this is where I think the most contribution we can do moving forward, we can make moving forward, because the remote sensing community has worked for several decades on identifying these, uh, th these algorithms. And there is numerous algorithms that tackle the one, for instance, chlorophyll or anthocyanin or carotenoids. And these are very important pigments and indicators of the health of the plants. And we know that they change under environmental stresses. So how can we incorporate these indices within the, the, the computation of our data? We tried, a, um, we, we tried the, to extract the water content, for instance, and we've been very successful. Uh, Yu Fang over here is actually the one who led this work, destructive versus estimated from images, and we've had very good relationship between the two. And he was able also to do to, to calculate evapotranspiration and separate transpiration from evaporation by having control pots in the greenhouse. We weren't very successful with the chlorophyll. So again, it's a trial and error. We've tried many algorithms, and some algorithms worked better than others, but it's a continuous process. And here we've related the spectral uh, indices, chlorophyll derived from the leaf level spectral into the image, and you can understand there are two different scales. So you can't really go take a little leaf and then compare it to the whole plants. But there are some indices that are working uh, much better than others. So we continue uh, on the, with this effort. We've been much more successful into deriving uh, nutrient contents from, from images. And this, again, using existing tools and existing algorithms. But again, we have to make this automated and, and uh, user friendly. And here, everything we have is actually all the algorithms and all the programs that we have created, we made sure that they're open source. And they're open source in two different ways. A user-friendly open source that they don't care, they just want to apply the algorithms. And, and, uh, and a way that scientists or computer scientists can take them, change the algorithms so they can make them uh, more tailored to their own crops. So if you visit our web page, everything we're creating is open source for everybody to download. Our next phase uh, is actually to, to, to make it available for all plant scientists. So basically, you enter your images in the system, you select your species, you select, it's like a drop-down menu, I want height, I want curvature, I want X, Y, and Z, and those uh, data will be analyzed for you for the specific crops that we have validated and developed uh, indices for. This should be ready and online within the next few months. 
And here I want to bring out so a study that was done by University of Saskatchewan, by your team, the, the economic team, and why isn't phenomic more widespread and used by more people? We've seen out of the thousands published uh, plant sciences papers, there were less than 300 that actually used the word phenomics in there. And it's basically for many reasons. For many reasons, because it's still a big data problem. It's not accessible. Me and many other plant scientists don't know how to handle this data and don't know what these images are going to give us. The other, the other possibility is that um, the technology is still changing. And if you knew a new iPad is coming in, in five months, you wait for the new iPad. But do you wait for the two-generation iPad or you invest now? So do you, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, how, it's, it's how things work. So I wait for you or you wait for us to, to figure out the system, develop a more accurate system before you decide to invest on. And of course, the, 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 uh, the breeders' um, perception of how much gain they're going to get out of investing in this multi-million dollar um, capacity. They can, you can argue, and I think I heard it from one of your breeders over here, I can go to the field and I look with my own eyes and I know which genotype is doing better than which other genotype. I don't need the multi-million dollar facilities to tell me. So there are all these considerations that are opportunities and challenges uh, that will dictate how the whole technology will move forward and how it gets ad adopted.